Thank you so much, Vince. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've just flown in from Copenhagen, as it happened, talking about happiness. Um, but I thought the best place to start, really, is to think about joy, to think about pleasure, and maybe something like this. It just goes on and on. Why are they so happy? Why does it make you feel so good? <laughs> Imagine what it's like when they're crying. So this, of course, is great for Monday mornings, or days when it rains as much <laughs> as it does today. Um, four laughing babies on YouTube will get you that fix. Um, at the same time, it's also very clear, I think, that we are living in a time of, a, of great change. And it's also very clear that there is something tragic about this consciousness that some of us are endowed with, and maybe not the president of the US, but most of us. Um, <laughs> Because, of course, as I, this quote I put up for you is from a, a very interesting book, which is a collaboration between the Nobel Prize-winning writer John Steinbeck and a field biologist called Ed Ricketts, and it's called Locke from the Sea of Cortez. And he says in there, man might be described fairly adequately if simply as a two-legged paradox. He has never become accustomed to the tragic miracle of consciousness. Perhaps, as has been suggested, his species has not set, has not jailed, but is still in a state of becoming bound by his physical memories to a past of struggle and survival, and limited in his futures by the uneasiness of thought and consciousness. And that, of course, is the paradox, isn't it? We are very good at predicting things, we are very good at remembering things, but we are finding it very difficult to be in the now. And yet, of course, we need to find out what is going on in our brains as we do this. Here's a man being trepanned, as in the famous painting by Hieronymus Bosch. The neurosurgeons that I'll show you later that I work with are not quite the same, although they've kept the hip headgear. Um, <laughs> we tend to put people in scanners. Most of you will have been in one of those. This is an MRI scanner. When you do that, you can see what is inside. The physicality of the human brain is very clear. And yet, of course, these 15 brains, I guess nobody will be able to tell me which of those are men and which are women and which of them is a famous BBC TV presenter who was not particularly happy being in my scanner. And of course, you can then start to look at how the brain develops, and you can even put more people in the scanner, um, which is, of course, very exciting. But what is it then that we see? Here's an artwork by my friend Annie Cattrall, who's taken a photo of her niece, of herself, and of her mother. And of course, the iris is the only part of the brain that we can see with the naked eye. And what we see then becomes a real kind of interesting question. Most of you will just see black blobs up there, black and white. And yet, if I show you this, you cannot help see my two daughters playing in the, in the sun. So what is it about the templates that we make? What is it about having to make meaning of things that we have to have these templates? Are we, in fact, prediction machines? So look at this little baby who's got a cochlear implant, which means that this baby is now able to hear, but what the baby hears is very different. It's like this. Did anybody understand any of that? And yet, if I give you a template, which is what most of us will hear, and not just the eight channels that I played you. The wife helped her husband. It's very difficult not to suddenly hear it, to make sense of the noise. And of course, that's what we do. We tend to experience the world. Here's a, a, a revolving brain, and most people in Oxford, when they see this, they say, ah, oh, yes, Morton, you are Danish. Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him so well. <laughs> And of course, I am Danish, I can't run away from that. And what I'm showing is a form of lobology. So as you can see up here, really what you see is if I was sort of facing you this way, this is the back of my brain, this is the front of the brain, this is if I was lying down, which I hope you won't be doing tonight, and this is if I'm looking at front of you. And in red, you get the visual cortex. So in other words, things come in through the retina, and then it basically comes to the back of the brain. And then in dark blue, you've got the sense of... of of hearing, and in light blue, the sense of being touched, and then in orange and yellow, what it's like to smell and taste things. But of course, the key things about any kind of map is really where they are the white spots. On the old maps, they wrote, here be dragons. And of course, that's where we really want to go. But before we went there, Annie had the great idea of actually making a set of sculptures of this. So if you go across to the Welcome Museum, you can actually see one of the first neural portraits of what it's like to really experience the world. 
Except, of course, the one thing we don't show you here is why does it have to mean anything? We're just showing you the five senses are in the brain. And, you know, we were fairly successful, but of course it was neurophenology. The idea that we just have blobs. This is a fairly good portrait of myself from the 17th century, where I'm sort of showing you exactly where the different blobs are on the brain. But of course, that's not how the brain works. The brain is a very complex network. In fact, borrowing a quote from Thomas Aquinas, quid quid recipitor al modum representis recipitor, which basically means that the contents is shaped by the container. And so in my work, I can basically work out what the wiring is in your brains using these MRIs. And I can look at how traffic is flowing on that wiring and then I can make a computer model that can basically give me the same kind of result. And then, of course, once I have a computer model, I can start to take it apart, and I can find out what are the important, the necessary and sufficient components that are necessary. So it becomes something more than neurophenology. And I do this with this wonderful man from Barcelona, Gustavo Deco. Everybody should have a friend in Barcelona. It means you can go there all on a regular basis. That really is a pleasure, but of course, I, when I talk about pleasure, I'm not talking about hedonism. It's not just the pursuit of pleasure, it's something else. Because of course, when it comes to pleasure, it is a cycle. Unfortunately, I, as I flew in, I had to content myself with some pretty not so good coffee. And at the moment, I'm in a wanting phase. I really, really would quite like to try some very good coffee. So I'm sort of in this kind of phase, I'm foraging for good coffee, and there may be some here. And once I have engaged with that, I then start liking it. And at some point, there will be great moments of pleasure during this process, and at some point, I can start thinking about science again. So pleasure really is what enables those phase transitions. So it's absolutely important. Now, I've done a lot of neurophrenology in my time. I've put lots of people in scanners, doing all kinds of things, eating things, uh, having social interactions, even taking methamphetamines. It was surprising, this was before crystal meth, it was before Breaking Bad. Um, <laughs> and it was surprisingly easy to get the, uh, the ethics for that. And what you find when you do this is that, of course, you get pleasure the first time you take it. So this is, in fact, the whole pleasure network being active. We also were able to get ethics to do gambling, which, of course, is also one of the great vice and pleasures of many people. But the one thing we couldn't do was sex. So I had to ally myself with a Dutch person, Janneke Georgiatis, who sort of is the master and Johnson's role into one person. And he looked into this very important question, namely, what happens in the brains of women when they fake orgasms compared to when they have real orgasms? Now, there's a real conundrum here, because we know from sex lies and videotapes, in other words, questionnaires, that only about 30% of women will have sex on a regular basis. I don't think many men would stand for the same thing, but the key thing really is to think about what happens in the brain. And as you can see up here, when you fake an orgasm, there's only a little bit of motor activity, but very little in the white spots in where the pleasure network is. On the other hand, when you have a real orgasm, you actually get that whole circuit. And you can say it's a bit frivolous to talk about sex um, on, a, on a rainful day in London. But of course it is. I am Scandinavian after all, right? So although not Dutch, but really what the reason why I want you to show these things is because you can see how you have different networks switching in and out. And one of the things that happen when you have affective disorders, when you have anhedonia, the lack of pleasure, is that you can't make that transition. You end up being addicted to things. You spend all your time here and there's very little pleasure and you go over that cycle quickly over and over again or you can't really get to those things. So the key thing here really is to think about how it is that there's almost like a choreography, a dance of how different brain regions are talking to each other as we go through this cycle. And that, of course, that traffic, that can be jammed, that can be closures of the roads. And trying to think about how we can unlock those, unblock those, is really how we can give people more pleasure. Now, you can do things to rats that you can't do to humans. You can take things out, and you can find out that there's a network of hedonic hotspots that if you stimulate here, in the ventral pallidum or in the nucleus accumbens, the rat will lick its lips more to sugar water, which is how you measure pleasure in, in, other, in other animals like rats. And you have a very similar kind of network in humans. And so really thinking about pleasure, before we start thinking about well-being, is thinking about how this dance of different regions go together. And there are many ways that one can change those. One of them is my good friend and colleague, Thibaut Assis, who's talking to somebody who uh, was very impressed with his work. Um, because what he was able to do is, was to stick an electrode into a girl with dystonia, which is a terrible motor disease. Um, that basically means that she's 
completely normal, but she's just unable to put her hands out and hold them in front of her. Now, if you drill a hole into her brain and rebalance the network in a part called the globus pallidus internal segment on both sides and put a battery onto the chest like a pacemaker, you can basically transform this girl's life. She, if you met her today, she would be exactly like a normal girl because this is what happens. Now, she also has to undergo a lot of physiotherapy in order to end up like this. And you'll see in a moment, she's such a wonderful woman, um, you can see how her left arm here at this point hadn't quite recovered from the, the toll of having this, this problem. So this is quite exciting that we can do this, that we now have such a good understanding that we can rebalance these networks. We can even do it for things that you can't see. If you were to be amputated, about 25% of those who get amputated get chronic phantom limb pains, and that's really quite awful. Earlier, people thought they could just amputate more, but then you just get a larger phantom. If you give people morphine, it works for about two months, and you're left with the constipation. Um, but if you, on the other hand, stimulate deep in the brain, in the periopsidoctyl gray, at 20 hertz, you can make that pain go away. You can have pleasure. And as it happens, when you scan people while they're doing that, you get activity in the pleasure circuit, not surprisingly. Now, if you stimulate at 90 hertz, the pain becomes unbearable. So in other words, it's the same circuit that subserves pain and pleasure. And when Annie heard that, she said, we've got to make another sculpture. So here's another sculpture instantiating what pain and pleasure really is in the brain. Now, how am I doing on time, sir? You've got um, four minutes if you can do it all. Ooh, I can do something better, I think. Let's talk about music. So when I, when, I talk, when I tell my students about this, they look up and say, who's that black guy? That's not Obama, is it? <laughs> Steven Pinker famously said that music was like auditory cheesecake. It could vanish and the species would be unchanged. I think he's completely wrong. And I think James Brown will show you why. So why is that so great, right? Don't be German on me. Don't do that, mother. <laughs> um, look at the figure and vase behind me. You can either see the vase or you can see the two faces. You can either hear the rhythm or you can hear the guitar going ta ka ta ka ka ta 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 ka ta ka ka ta And it's all about prediction error. It's all about having a template and matching that template. So we took the classic funk beats. Um, and here, hopefully, there will be a simple one where we just tried something like this. <coughs> Not particularly danceable, right? Maybe with a handbag. <laughs> it's too predictable, right? I mean, it's not, that, it's not that funky. But what if we add a little bit of spice, a little bit of syncopation to get us going? There's a, not quite James Brown. There's not the, yeah! <laughs> but you can tell how, because it's a little bit more unpredictable, it's more interesting. And so we like it. We like to move. We like it. What if we add a lot of complexity to it. It's like crouch, celebrating a goal, right? I mean, it's too unpredictable. So we were interested in this. We asked people, and it becomes an inverted U-shape. The kind of things that are too predictable are the things that you basically don't particularly want and don't particularly like by the things that are just at the right kind of level of predictability is what you like. And so we couldn't help ourselves make one of these models that I alluded to. We make a model and try to see what are the components that are important. It turns out that when you are in the groove, you are meter-stable, which is a term from dynamical systems. And you can measure this very precisely. And when you then look at what regions are responsible for that, you get what I call the eudaimonia of groove. Namely, you get the pleasure circuit, which is the frontal pit of the brain, but also parts in the back. So a whole network that subserves the meaningfulness of music the reason why you want to make dance. And of course, we have to go back to Aristotle because that's exactly what he said. He said, let there be James Brown. No, that's not what he said. He said, <laughs> hedonia and eudaimonia is basically what happiness is all about. And the lack of pleasure, of course, and hedonia is one of the key components of most mental illnesses. So I'm betting on that we could help learn about happiness by understanding pleasure, but it's not going to be enough. We've got to understand about eudaimonia, and music is a good thing. And not only music, because together with Robin Carthart Harris, we've been very interested in psilocybin and various other drugs, which are incredibly meaningful for reasons we don't understand. But for instance, it's one of the things that can break this cycle. 
About 60 to 70 percent of patients that try psilocybin together to quit their nicotine addiction will actually go through it. But at the end of the day, though, it's not about psilocybin, magic mushrooms. It could be about music. It's certainly not about deep brain electrodes. It's about being with other people. Here's my good friend, Roman Kasnarik, who, taught, who has written a book on empathy. And together, we've made this museum called the Empathy Museum. If you haven't seen it, you should go. And then you should come next time we do one of our pop-up things. And then you might be able to go and walk in the blue shoes of a crazy professor and listen to the stories that we tell ourselves, or in the high heels of, a, of somebody who works in a different kind of life. So I think there's a lot to be done. Um, I think the key thing, though, and I'm very happy when Vince told me that he is going to do something on poetry, because, of course, poetry is perhaps one of those things that really gives us meaning, that really gives us a sense of, of joy. And Derek Walcott, sadly, is no longer with them, but he said, for every poet, it is always morning in the world. History a forgotten insomniac night. History and elemental awe are always our early beginning because the fate of poetry is to fall in love with the world in spite of history. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for having me, Vince and everybody. Um, so we all know that our um, happy mind makes a happy uh, body. So I would like to speak about how I think we can make ourselves happy, and that is through dance. So I dance, and I think everybody should dance. It's a physical exercise. It makes our body healthy. It's relating to uh, immune-boosting effects and to health in general. And it gives us the right kind of pleasure, as we just heard from Morton. So it's just so good for us. But then many of you are going to tell me, as it has happened throughout my PhD, people say, I can't dance and I don't want to dance. <laughs> and, so what about watching dance then, I ask? Well, we can, you know, go to the theater, we can stay on the sofa and watch dance, uh, even just on the YouTube channel. So I spent a lot of my PhD and my postdoctoral work at the University of the Balearic Islands and City University London in asking the question, what do I get out of watching dance? So watching dance in the lab, basically what I do is I invite a lot of people who don't dance and I have them watch little short video clips of dance um, in the lab while I record two things from them. They're answers, what they think they see, what they feel, so subjective reports, ratings, and their physiology. And that's because we know that when we feel an emotion, our body reacts as well, and we have electrodes to measure this. So we will attach little electrodes to people's fingers, and we, I can measure if people are actually feeling an emotion um, as well. And then I have them watch ballet, for example. So I would like to share three pieces of evidence with you today about this work. Um, first, the question we were asking ourselves, is there emotion in a dance movement or is it just pretty or something? So we found something quite surprising for us. There are some specific shapes that just make us happy for some reason. So these were round shapes. So I'm going to show you here. Um, what we showed participants were just these videos I was talking about. And some of these videos were mostly rounded movements, so all round. And other movements were more like edgy. And the majority of people felt really happy when they saw the round movements, while not really happy when they saw the edgy ones. So that's important. And if we look at the entire art history, for example, a lot of depictions of dance movements were actually such that depicted round movement, like back bends or round of the arms and so on, and that across cultures and across times. Another thing that struck us, struck us and that really doesn't make dance, uh, dancers happy is that extreme movements are happy, uh, making people happy. So, for example, I'm showing you four pictures here of someone like stretching their leg very high up, and we found that people were more happy when they saw very extreme type of movements. Interesting as well. So again, we went to the Archaeological History Museum and just checked, and again, a lot of the representations were these extreme times of stretches. Okay, let's try. 
I would like to show you some of the videos and see if the same happens for you. So I brought two videos. One is from a sad ballet and one is from a happy ballet. And I'm going to play them one after the other and then I'm going to ask you which one you thought was happy and which one was sad. So let's have a look at this one first. Don't say anything. Don't give it away. And then the other one. So who thinks that this last one was happy? The majority, <laughs> like in our study. <laughs> so just to look again, you can see the roundedness and the edginess. So something so simple is just about making people happy with the right moves. Second question, let's move on, Christian, quickly. So um, obviously when we watch a dance, it's not just about what we see, it's also about what we hear. I didn't bring music. Morton showed the effect it had on all of us, so we know that now. But we tried to investigate that also in the lab, and we combined sad and happy music with sad and happy dance. So we had people watch all these video clips while they were listening sometimes to music that was congruent with what they were seeing, and sometimes it was incongruent with what they were seeing. And we found that the music and the dance had a super additive effect. So if the music and the dance matched, not only did people find the emotions more stronger, that they felt, but also their bodies reacted much more strongly. So there's something about the music and the dance that shares something that makes us actually feel something very strongly, and that makes a big point for the sofa version of the dance watching, of course. But then this happened, which was basically, <laughs> dancing is good for the ed. And uh, where this came from was from a study showing where we were looking at dancers and lay people because we really were interested in, does it make a difference if I have training in dance for my experience of a dance? So we compared dancers and non-dancers when they were watching these ballet movements. And we recorded again their body responses as well as their subjective reports. And what we found was it did make a difference. Not only did the dancers rate the emotions more strongly, but also their bodies were more sensitive to the different movements and different emotions expressed with the movements. So maybe there's something beyond the sofa anyway. Um, I would like to finish with a happy outlook, which is just summing up what we found so far. Very simple, that there are some uh, movements that just make us more happy than others. So if you want to be happy, go out and find the right moves. Um, <laughs> watching dance, just watching dance makes us sweat. So we found that, and in that endeavor, um, dance and music have a super additive effect, so uh, try to find the right moves with the right sound. So is watching dance as good as uh, doing dance. Well, I guess there's still some important research to do here, but at least remember the expertise effects, there seems to be something about it. So, just as a final reflection, so we all have an intuition about music being a tool for us that we can use to enhance our mood, but maybe we should give dance a chance too. So, therefore, I have a task for you tonight before bed. Go to your browser, Google, for example, dance class, plenty to choose from. <laughs> Or Google tickets for dance performance. Please do it. <laughs> You'll feel very happy. Thank you to everybody. <laughs>
trying to measure human flourishing, but really just asking people to reflect on their life and to tell us how satisfied, how happy they feel. And in contrast, we have hedonic pleasure, you know, immediate feelings of satiation or happiness or pleasure. So I think so far this evening, we've talked a lot about joy and pleasure in the moment, and we haven't talked much about satisfaction, about our feelings of happiness with ourselves and our lives. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. So the way that we try and measure this in people is mostly in surveys. So the kinds of questions that we might ask people is things like, do you agree or disagree with, in most ways, my life is close to the ideal? So far, I've gotten the important things out of life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. And because there's quite a lot of people interested in happiness, from governments to NGOs to academics, you're actually able to ask quite a lot of people these questions. So there's something called the World Value Survey that actually measures hundreds of thousands of people all over the world over time and asks them these kinds of questions, as well as you know, many, many other surveys and measures we've got. So everything I'm going to talk to you about this evening is based on these very large samples of people being asked these questions about, about how satisfied they feel with their lives. So one of the questions that I'm going to try and answer first is about who is happiest. So who in these hundreds of thousands of people reports being most satisfied with their lives? And maybe we can get some lessons there about what kinds of people are happier. Now, before I, I go into this, I do think there's an important caveat to make. So when anyone, whenever anyone is trying to convince you with survey evidence, I want you to think about this graph. This graph is a correlation between per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Now, the point I'm making is that some of the evidence I'm showing you is just a correlation. It's just saying like, hey, people who are like this report being happiest. It doesn't mean that because they are like that, that caused them to be happy. It just means that it's a correlation, okay? Um, so I'm gonna start off and we're gonna talk about age. So when we tell teenagers that, uh, that this is the best time of their life, that um, it's amazing to be young and to be a student and to have no responsibilities, that's kind of true, um, because it seems like they're certainly happier than people for most of their adult life. But actually, the really old people, they're much happier. Um, so there is this very well-known U-shaped curve in happiness. And this has been shown in across samples, across people, you know, in, the, in these vast numbers of people that we ask. This is the pattern we see in age. And to be honest, we're not exactly sure why this is. Probably one of the most prevalent uh, explanations is that it's really about expectations. So as we get older, we have these expectations about what life should be like. And then, unfortunately, we constantly feel like we don't actually, our lives don't meet those expectations. So as we get older, the kind of gap between these expectations becomes more realized, and so then people report being less satisfied with their life. And then as we get older, we kind of adjust our expectations, and that's why people, when they get you know, more, more elderly, that they get happier. And this isn't just shown through surveys. Um, this is the rate of antidepressant use across age. So again, we see the opposite direction because this is antidepressants. Um, and you can even see this evidence in monkeys. So um, some researchers went and asked all the zookeepers, um, or many of the zookeepers across the world, and asked them, how happy do your monkeys seem? Um, which is, must be kind of an odd, odd question to get. Now, the zookeepers had no idea what the study was about. They weren't told why they were being asked this. But then the researchers were able to look at the age of these primates and then the reported kind of uh, happiness of these primates. And again, the same U-shaped curve arises. Um, what's interesting is that it depends on the kind of questions you ask. So you can kind of see that in general, life satisfaction questions, you see the same kind of shape. Is my life worthwhile? Do you see kind of a very similar shape? General, how happy are you? You see a general shape. 
but actually you see the anxiety levels are much higher in midlife. So this is an alternative explanation for why this is. That basically life becomes more stressful in midlife. Maybe we have more responsibilities placed on us. Maybe you know, you've got parents to look after, children to look after, and that anxiety could also be an explanation. Another um, kind of group that does seem happiest is people who report being satisfied with their relationships. So that's both romantic relationships, but also in terms of people who have lots of friends, who spend lots of time with their friends. This is one of the biggest like, predictors of who is happy and who's not, basically your personal relationships. So you can see here that people who say that they're satisfied with their relationships report being much happier than people who report not being satisfied. Now, another one is money. And money gets people really interested about happiness. Because in many ways, we don't really like to think that money leads to happiness. You know, we have this idea that, oh, you can't buy happiness. You know, happiness comes from within. I still don't really understand where that idea came from. Because to me, like, <laughs> if you look across countries, rich countries are happier than poor countries. Quite straightforward. Within countries, if you're poor within a country, then you're less happy than if you're rich within a country. So at least cross-sectionally, as in if you measure it at one point of time, money does lead to happiness, especially at the low end. So especially for those people who earn little amounts of money, even very small increases can dramatically improve people's well-being. But it's not just about having money. There's also increasing evidence about how you use your money impacts your happiness. So if people use their limited budget, which we all have a limited amount to spend, if we spend more of it on experiences and not stuff, then people seem to be happier from those experiences. Uh, if we spend more money on others rather than just buying stuff for ourselves, we seem to be happier as well. So even though we can't kind of wave a, wave a magic wand and become richer, maybe we can allocate our spending differently to try and improve our happiness as well. Another one is fulfilling employment, that if people feel in control of their lives, if they feel that they're doing something they're good at, that's another super strong predictor of who is happy and who's not. Now, I think I know what you're all thinking now. I think what you're thinking is, this is just too easy. Like, all you're telling me is, I need to get really rich, I need to have amazing relationships, both romantically and otherwise, I need to find a job that I'm like kick ass at and that I find really feeling control and fulfilling. Like, I'm just gonna go home tonight and be much happier. But the thing is that actually it's a bit more complicated than that. And the reason it's more complicated is because of this thing called hedonic adaption. Now, basically, hedonic adaption, it's not a good or a bad thing, but it changes what it means to try and pursue happiness. If we're trying to become happier, then hedonic adaption can be your enemy. So let me explain. Basically, everything that we do, everything that changes in our lives, we just adapt to. That's what the human condition is. We're supposed to be good at adapting to changing environments. And that's the same with happiness. So even though things that we think might really impact our happiness, we just adjust. So within a few years, no matter kind of what happens to us, we seem to go back to a set point. So if you look about marriage, you think that maybe, like I showed you, that relationships matter. Maybe if we get married, we're going to be much happier. But no. We're happier a bit beforehand. We're really happy on the day. That's awesome. And then pff, back, to, back to normal. No. Marriage, not, not, not really helping. Birth of a child. Um, again, pretty awesome just before. Pretty crappy just afterwards. But again, we just adjust back to the set point. Um, even when really terrible things happen, even when really awful things, like the death of a spouse, we do adjust back within a few years. Um, uh, you can even see that someone's a bit happy at the end um, there, but this depends on gender and depends on a few other things. But basically, um, we just adapt to what happens to us. Now, this has really important implications for us pursuing happiness. Because if we're trying to pursue happiness, but then we know that we adapt every time, then we need to think about how big the changes are that are happening in our lives. If we win the lottery tomorrow, but then we adapt to that, and in a couple of years' time, we're back to normal levels of happiness, then we can't really win the lottery twice. You know? uh, so really, 
It's about steady changes, steady gains. People would be much happier if they slowly increased their income over time than if they had some massive windfall. And similarly with other areas of life, slow goal fulfillment that feels like you're making progress is going to make people happier than big changes. And similarly, if you think about things like if someone was to become disabled versus a chronic illness, all the evidence shows that for many disabilities that are kind of one-off instances, people do adjust. But for chronic illnesses where we feel bad continuously over time, we don't adjust to that. So thinking about what kinds of things might change our levels of well-being and trying to avoid certain things more than others would also be a way for people to try and improve their level of happiness. So I want to kind of summarize um, and finish off this evening by just a piece of advice, which is basically that we need to relax a bit more. Because really, in many ways, we can't fully like, pursue happiness because we'll just adjust back to it. And even if though, like, the worst things that you're really worried about happening to you, you'll adjust to those so they won't affect you as much as you think. Similarly, the things that you think will really make you happy, you'll adjust to that too, so that's not going to make you as happy as you think. So basically, live a nice life, try and make, improve some things by maybe changing how you spend money, trying to make small goals rather than big changes. But at the same time, almost anything that happens to you, we will adjust back to. So thanks very much. <laughs>